Hey everyone, Richard Tubb back here again with another interview and I'm excited today is long overdue our next guest. I'm joined today by Steve Petrishuk, the network management expert and technology advocate at Orvic Networks. Now, if you're not familiar with Orvic, they provide a cloud-based network management software that keeps IT networks around the world running optimally. More on Orvic shortly, but Steve, welcome to TubTalk. Thanks so much for having me, Richard. So glad to finally be here. I know. Well, we've talked about it for quite some time, haven't we? And I think for not just you and I, but for everyone, 2020 was a little bit of a challenging year. So, But we've got you here now. Yep, a little bit of a roller coaster over the past few months, but uh, I think there's light at the end of the tunnel here as we, we keep moving forward. Indeed, indeed. So let's jump straight in. For anyone who's not familiar with Orvic, how would you describe what you and the company do? Sure. So, so what we do is we help uh, SMBs manage network infrastructure. So when it comes to um, you know, understanding how the network is uh, connected, configured, performing, we provide amazing visibility into that underlying network infrastructure and you know, help them be proactive in managing and monitoring that. Um, you know, in the, those rare cases where you do have to be reactive, uh, we want to help accelerate that uh, time to, to resolution. So really, you know, reduce the MTTR when troubleshooting network issues. Uh, so it's all sort of focused around network infrastructure management and monitoring. Yeah. And, and full disclosure for you listeners, you know, I'm an advisor to Orvic Networks. I have been for a few years now, actually. And the reason I'm an advisor to Orvic is they have a product that I believe is part of the foundations of the next generation of managed service providers. I think it is a very, very cool product, as we will find out more about. But today, we're specifically going to talk about Orvic's network field report for 2021. Uh, now, the network field report is based on data from, I think, Steve, I'd be right in saying, it's about 350 um, IT professionals. Um, we've got IT managers, IT directors, IT specialists, network managers, network administrators, and they're mostly US and Canada based, aren't they, in North America? Yep, that's correct. So uh, 350 uh, of these IT professionals, um, we went out and uh, surveyed them with a, a number of questions, and maybe we can dive into those questions, uh, sort of what the, the topics were in, in a minute. Um, but basically trying to get an understanding of uh, what their day-to-day -day looks like, what the state of their network looks like, what they spend their time doing, what they enjoy doing, what they don't enjoy doing. So that really you know, was the, the purpose of this, um, uh, of, of this survey. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, if anybody wants to run off now, pause this episode and go and grab your own copy. It's a free download, orvic.com forward slash network field 21. We'll include that in the show notes and I'll give you a link to that as we go through uh, today's conversation. I want to say up front, Steve is somebody who is incredibly impressive if you follow him on social media. Uh, this is a man with his finger on the pulse of network management. He is my go-to guy uh, for sort of network management advice here. Um, I want to get as much out of Steve as we possibly can at that big brain of his, uh, but I think a really good way to do it is to focus on this network field report because it contains so much interesting information. So Steve, if I you know jump straight in here, what would you describe as the most eye-opening facts that you've gathered in this survey? Sure. So the number one uh, takeaway that we sort of got from this, and uh, you'll sort of leave with that with that biggest uh, punch, is that there is a big disconnect between the confidence in the, the network, so how confident people are in their network's ability uh, to deliver service to their end users, and the average IT professional's knowledge of that network. So what we end up having is we have a, a bunch of technicians who are super confident, but they're not knowledgeable about the underlying network. And so we can start to speculate on some of the reasons why that's the case, uh, but that big gap is probably the first thing that, that stood out to us, this, this confidence without knowledge. And I think that's a, a little bit of a blind spot that a lot of professionals need to sort of pay attention to. I, it, it, that's the first thing that jumped out to me as well, Steve. In fact, I'd go as far as to say it blew my mind. So if I'm reading this right, more than half of the respondents admitted that they didn't know really how their network is configured Yet three quarters of those same people report a high or very high confidence in their network. Help me, help me understand. How can that be? <laughs> yes. So I think it's uh, rooted in the fact that you know, if we haven't had an issue, we haven't had to be reactive in a certain for a certain period of time. We, we therefore get this confidence, right? So we, uh, things have been operating smoothly. I haven't had to react. My network is still performing. I haven't had user calls. So I build up this this sense of confidence just because I haven't had any issues recently. It's sort of that that recency bias. 
uh, I think all it takes is one incident in the network for then you to realize, I actually don't know how things are connected and configured. I don't know how the network is performing, and I don't have the tools in place to help me react to this uh, user issue quickly. And that's when we'll start to see that confidence decrease. You know, I, I think it's great overall that we're, we're confident. It allows us to all sort of sleep well at night, but we just want to make sure that, that confidence is, is not you know, misplaced. Uh, so that, you know, I think as we move forward, the the better job we could do about understanding the networks that we manage, um, how they're performing, how they're connected, how they're configured, so that you know our, our confidence is justified. I'm not saying we need to reduce our confidence; we just need to make sure that we have the knowledge to back that up. Yeah, I, I find it intriguing. So my background is I'm a former um, managed service provider owner uh, myself, mostly in the SMB space, it's got to be said, but we often inherited networks, um, infrastructures um, that had either been neglected, never looked after. And um, for the benefit of listeners at home, you, you can't see Steve on video, but he's got a big smile on his face and he's nodding here. So he knows what I'm talking about. Um, but we often inherited those type of networks. And actually, um, despite our best, best efforts, I think what most MSPs do is they take a, if it ain't broke, don't fix it sort of attitude uh, towards here. So what advice would you give to people who have perhaps inherited a network, don't really know how it's working, but it is just working, so they don't want to break it? For sure. So I I think the first stage in there is uh, sort of doing that network assessment process, right? Going through, doing a network discovery, understanding what's out there. I I know a lot of service providers will build that in as part of their ongoing service as well, right? Whether it's a quarterly or semi-annual basis, go through and just survey the network if you're not doing it all the time, you know, always on. Uh, That way you have a sort of that level set of of what is on the network, what you're expected to manage. You know what changes that the customer may may be introducing to the network. I mean, I I was smiling earlier because I, I there's you know been on thousands of deployment calls uh, when we deploy the Avic software out to to an end client network, and I, I want to say it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 75 plus percent of those. They, there's a device that is found that the the um, MSP didn't know about. Right? Here's this device. Oh, I didn't know that was there. Oh, I didn't realize they had this device. It happens all the time. And so, uh, just going through that first initial network assessment process, you don't have to make changes right away. It's not saying you know you have to make recommendations or charge your customer more, but just it empowers you with knowledge about how that network, you know, what, what you're expected to manage, and it reduces the number of surprises later on. Yeah, and it's it's more important than ever, isn't it? I mean, I'm looking around the studio garage where I'm at home in Newcastle upon Tyne now, and apart from technology from last century that I can see because I'm a big retro gaming fan, but I've also got devices. There's IP cameras. There's um, the, there's um, online calendars. There's all sorts of things going on here that I can see. So I know if I run a scan on my own network in my own little house here, it comes up with devices that I'm like, hmm, not really sure what that is. So I can only manage Imagine what it's like across these wider deployments. Oh, for sure. As soon as you open up that guest wireless, you know, you never know what's, what someone's going to come in and connect to it. Yeah, exactly. So something else that that really surprised me from the report, something that jumped out as well. You know, I used to run a managed service provider business. And, and what I tell other MSPs now to, uh, to try and avoid making the mistakes that I made when I was running an MSP is to sort of aim for 25% of their time being reactive. I think if, if people are spending 25% of their time reacting to things, that's probably a good benchmark. Yet the respondents in this survey said that 58% of their time was spent on reactive rather than proactive tasks. That sort of surprised me. Can you dig into those numbers and and why you think that might be, Steve? Yeah, so I think it it comes down to, um, you know, as IT professionals, we spend a lot of time, uh, you know, in this reactive state and starting to dig yourself up from that can be very, very challenging over time. Uh, so what we uh, basically have to do is we have to almost you know, do that pause and reset to allow us to get in front of the reactive change. Uh, it's no easy task, right? It's no easy feat to mm-hmm. just say, you know, for today I'm reactive, tomorrow I'm gonna be proactive. Uh, but we need to understand um, a little bit about the tasks that we're doing that are causing us to be re- reactive, where we're spending our time, are we spending our time most efficiently? Uh, one of the other points that, that came up in the report is that there was uh, about 52% of the respondents said that they uh, spend the majority of their time doing projects that they hate or tolerate. Yeah. So that's a lot of time doing things that you don't want to do. Um, if those are the reactive tasks that you don't want to do, what, what can I do to start to automate some of those to help you know um, replace those with a, a tool to uh, maybe out Source those to, uh, you know, if you have a, a knock service that you want to leverage as, you know, to outsource some of those menial um, you know, tasks. What, what are those things that I don't like doing that I'm spending a ton of time doing that I can look to, to offload uh, to allow myself to work on the more proactive, more value added uh, yeah. tasks? 
And what sort of tasks would they be? So something, I guess, that springs to mind, you know, documentation, network mapping, we've already talked about, config backups, that type of thing. Is that, you know, what else are people doing reactively that really should be automated in this day and age? So I think you've touched on some of the the key things there, like the, you know, uh, documentation, right? There are are a ton of automated tools to help me automate my documentation, whether it is inventory or mapping or configuration management, all those have a a solution in place. You know, obviously Avic is one of those solutions to help with that, but uh, you know, that is something, no matter what tool you use in your business, if you have one existing, leverage that to help you get ahead of those tasks, stop doing those, those manual tasks. Because if we go back to that um, percentage of time that uh, technicians spend on uh, tasks that they hate, there are other things there that are not, you know, just all documentation. There may be uh, user <laughs> calls, right? I, I'm mm. sure everyone, you know, we've all gotten that call from an end user that it's like, oh, it's that user again. Oh, they're having that same, you know, Wi-Fi problem. So how can we look at automating some of those tasks or getting in front of, of those end user issues? Uh, and that also comes down to a little bit more proactive management. So maybe not all networking related. There might be other um, non-networking related tasks yeah, in front yeah. as well. But I, I think one takeaway for you know for listeners and, and again go and download this report yourself. It's orvic.com forward slash network field twenty one. We'll include that in the show notes as well. Uh, you know uh, we're spending an awful lot of time as IT professional doing stuff that nowadays can be automated and we we don't need to be doing it. Something else that um, you know more than a quarter of the respondents here said uh, that they rarely or never update their network documentation. That really shocked me, uh, Steve. You know, I get on my soapbox about um, uh, the the benefit of people updating their documentation. Um, Why is documentation, network documentation, so important? So I I think the most obvious one is that if I'm not if I'm not updating the documentation, why aren't I updating it? Uh, most often it's because I am the network expert or I am the IT expert. I know everything. It's in my head. I, you know, I have a good understanding of how things um, you know, are connected and configured and, and performing. I, I think one of the downsides of having that approach is that uh, I'm now not able to outsource any of those functions that I, I could have outsourced. So, so take away the fact that you know, we're all human and something could happen to us. You know, we like to, you know, I could win the lottery tomorrow and, and leave the business. So I've now left the business exposed. Uh, but if I haven't documented anything, then I become the expert that everyone goes to when, when they have a problem. Uh, one thing that I personally have been focusing on uh, here at Avic over the past few months is taking all the things that I've learned about, uh, whether it's about our, our tool or, or about network management and trying to document as much of that as possible and disseminate it to the rest of the team. So that um, I'm not always the one that is getting those questions um, about that that network infrastructure. So if I if I apply that same um, idea to this documentation problem for those 25% of people that that aren't um, documenting the network at all or never updating the documentation, you are now the source of truth. You are the you know you are the documentation. Um, so as everyone is coming to you and extracting some of that information, you want them to go somewhere else. You don't want them to consume your time. Your time is, you know, should be spent on more valuable tasks. So, so how can we take that documentation that you know, let's automate that process, let's help, let's have it updated, let's have it documented somewhere outside of, you know, your, your brain. Um, and that way, you know, you can outsource or, or offload a lot of that function that would, you know, typically be coming to you for that information. They can go look somewhere else. Yeah, you make a really good point here. You know, I talk to MSPs about what um, is a single point of failure in their business. And most of us as technology professionals, we look to the tech being a single point of failure. All too often, isn't it, Steve? It's what's kept up in people's heads that really needs to be shared with the team. So, you know, if you're taken out of the business for whatever reason, if you've got all that knowledge in your head, it's going to do nobody else any good whatsoever. But I really like your point about, you know, um, if, if anybody listening to this has maybe getting a bit tired with other engineers tapping them on the shoulder. Hey, Steve, what's the IP address for this? Or, hey, Steve, what's the username and password or whatever? That's going to ring a, a strike a, a chord with people, isn't it? It's something that you and I are very, very used to. And getting that information out of your head down into documentation is so important for that. Yeah, absolutely. We, I know we, we talk a lot in when we're talking to um, our MSP partners and then clients about uh, alleviating some of the, the time that the uh, – level three techs used to spend on some of the, these networking tasks and enable the uh, level one, level two techs to start to solve those problems. And a key part of doing that is taking that, you know, uh, taking that knowledge, taking that expertise, taking that, you know, um, all sort of those systems, process, documentation that they've built up in their minds over time and bringing that, you know, sort of knowledge is power, sharing that with the rest of the team. 
So as much as possible, we want to be enabling everyone across the business to, to perform sort of yeah. these network functions. Makes a lot of sense. A couple of other things that jumped out to me about the report, uh, and again, you know, a big shout out for this report. And how many years have, have all been producing this now? It's got to be three or four years, right? So we do a, a couple of different types of reports. We did this uh, network field report back in 2015. So it was actually mm. a six year gap between the, the two reports, which is actually, you know, Showing some light on a few metrics that have moved, uh, but this is the second time that we've done the network field report. Yeah, uh, there you go. I, it felt like you've done it every single year. I'm giving you way more credit than you deserve. So take that. We, we deserve it all. For, for, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the two things that, that sort of jumped out at me, um, it was to do with the automation piece. So the report tells us that between 28 and 55 percent of network configs a change daily, uh, respondents were saying. And, and, you know, if you're interested, that percentage grows depending on the size of the business. Yet I know from experience that device configuration backups are rarely thought about uh, until it's too late. You know, it's a little bit like backups as a whole. And, you know, almost a quarter of small businesses, the report tell us, and small businesses being one to 10 employees, they never back up their configs. So, my question for you, Steve, is this is an is this an opportunity for MSPs managing smaller clients? For sure. I mean, there's absolutely um, an opportunity to uh, to start to back up those network device configs. Obviously, I don't want to be spending a ton of time doing it, um, especially as we go towards the the lower end of the company size. As you get into those smaller SMBs, right? They you, you can't really devote that same amount of time to, they all have a firewall, they're all gonna have a switch. So the number of network devices doesn't necessarily scale linearly with the number or with the number of employees. So as you get smaller, you know, the, the uh, sort of the, the cost to, um, or the, the manual cost in backing up those configurations, you know, it's sort of the same, whether they're 10 users or 50 users, they're both gonna have a firewall and switch maybe a couple switches. Um, but what we can do is we can uh, go in and start to automate some of those configuration backups, right? Add some tooling into, into the mix to help you um, provide a service to help, again, back up those configurations with sort of as minimal effort as possible. And so that's what I would, if, if I was uh, a service provider, I'd be looking to say, Here, here's an opportunity to reduce the risk for this customer by, you know, backing up those network device configs. I can do it with automation. It's therefore fairly low cost to me to do. I don't have to add people to the problem and I get an immediate win once I start backing up that configuration. So it's mm. definitely something that you should look into. Yeah. And you touched upon something earlier that I want to elaborate on, and that is the security side of uh, things. Um, so obviously, we're not just doing this because we love creating documentation. We're not just doing it for the fun of doing it. You know, more than ever, I think the pandemic has shown us that uh, cybersecurity is hugely, hugely important. Have you got any advice for people listening on what best practices um, they should be putting in place to mitigate any risks involved with their uh, network vulnerabilities? Yeah, so so if we highlight just this uh, this configuration management piece as one type of visibility, right? So there's uh, so there's a risk in, in not backing up the, the configurations, and that risk is is basically if I was to make a change today and I don't back that up for a day, a week, a month, uh, every day that goes by, and I make additional changes and I haven't backed up that configuration, uh, if I try to revert back to the last configuration backup I have, I, I've now lost a bunch of those changes, which may be things like um, access control lists for security policies or updated security policies. Uh, I can generally get things like antivirus or IPS updates uh, directly from the vendor when I do that restore. But there's some risk introduced every day that I don't back up that configuration and I make a change. So what we have to do is we have to look to the business and say, what is an acceptable risk? What is an acceptable window between when I've last backed up my configuration and the last change that I've made? And for the most mature and largest organizations, that window is very, very small. It's you know, every configuration change you make needs to be backed up. Um, I would say that general rule of thumb should apply to every business that if you make a change, you should be backing it up. However, you know, for a 10 user organization, maybe um, that risk is smaller. So if you take a, you know, a risk approach to this, uh, maybe I don't need to, to back it up every single time I make a change. However, if there's automation and tools that allow me to do that, why wouldn't I take advantage of it, right? Why wouldn't I have the um, lowest risk in my configuration management policies? Why wouldn't I back it up as, as often as I could? Because the cost is the same whether I do it once a week or once a month, right? 
Yeah, absolutely. Why wouldn't you do it? It's the bottom line, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. automation. We've touched on, you know, a rep- recurring theme of this conversation, Steve, is IT professionals doing things manually that really, really should be automated in today's uh, in today's world. I, I touched on, you know, the, the COVID-19 pandemic and then the last report that was uh, 2015, even if I give you yeah. credit for doing a report every year that you didn't do. Um, okay. <laughs> interesting. I'm interested, though. Do you think the survey uh, indicates how the pandemic might have impacted uh, organizations with regards to how they look after their networks? So one thing that stood out for me uh, in the report, uh, and we talked a little bit about what uh, the different tasks are that IT professionals spend their time doing. And one thing that came up in the report, we, we sort of asked a question on, do you spend your time doing um, you know, research on new systems, deploying new systems, maintaining existing systems? And when we did the uh, report back in 2015, uh, what we found is that 39% of the time was spent on implementing and researching uh, new systems. So that means 60% of the time one then was spent uh, doing things like maintaining existing system. If we uh, fast forward uh, to the 2021 report, we asked the same question. What we found is that nearly 60%, I think it was like 58 or 59% uh, of time was spent on implementing and researching new systems. And so I think this is uh, really indicative of, of how uh, the, the pandemic has changed uh, the tasks that an IT professional does every day. We were sort of forced into this digital transformation, right? I've, I'm sure you've seen the memes on uh, whether it's LinkedIn or Facebook, where it's, you know, who caused the digital transformation in your business? Was it the CEO, the CTO, or COVID? And, you know, for a lot of people, it's COVID, right? And so we, we're now found us, us, ourselves spending a ton of time um, researching and implementing new systems. Um, and that's you know up significantly since 2015. So probably the biggest thing that we saw in the report in terms of behavior change from 2015 to now. That's interesting. And, and as we said, right at the top of our interview, it's been an unusual year, yep. but it's, you know, there's been a lot of positives coming out of it as well. And I think the fact that digital transformation has been pushed way up the agenda in most businesses, small or big, is um, is probably a really good thing. Um, mm-hmm. Has the report uncovered anything that you're surprised is still a challenge, if that question makes sense? Is there anything in there that you're sort of scratching your head as a, you know, a tech evangelist thinking, why is this still a challenge for um, uh, for network managers? So we touched on a couple of those things already. Uh, one of them is the network device configuration backups, right? I, I think that's an area where uh, there are so many tools out there for uh, for MSPs, for independent SMBs that help you automate some of these configuration changes. Some of them are, are configuration backups. Some of them are provided by the vendor, right? Um, so if I, you know, partner with uh, firewall vendor X or switch vendor Y, you know, they may have tools available to help me um, automate those configuration backups, or there are other third party tools that, that help me do that as well. And that is probably one of the biggest things that surprises me. It's, it's such a, an easy win uh, to help um, automate some of those. Um, that and the, when we, we talked a little bit about this as well, but it was the, that project engagement or how, how much time technicians are spending um, doing projects that they hate or tolerate, right? If, if we're spending 52% of the time doing things that we don't like to do, that's not sustainable, right? We, uh, I'm not saying we're going to like every minute of every day on the job, but we should at least like the majority of it, right? It, it should be the, you know, the exception, not the norm to work on something that I don't really want to work on. Agreed. So, I think we need to take a look at how we can pivot that around and start to um, find the time to do things that we do enjoy doing. Uh, and I think that a lot of that comes down to how do we you know, automate those things that we don't like doing. Yeah. I'm, I'm very conscious of your time here, Steve. I know you're a very busy man and man in demand. So thank you again for uh, giving the time today. Before you go that, I'm really intrigued. What does a typical day look like for Steve, the technology evangelist, the, the network management expert? You must speak to hundreds, if not thousands of like IT solution providers and MSPs every day. What's a typical day look like for you? I would say there probably is no typical day. I was actually, I was, I was having this conversation with, with a, a colleague of mine, uh, I think it was a week or two ago, and every day is a little bit different. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I spent some time uh, speaking to prospective uh, partners. I spent some time speaking to existing partners. I, I spent a lot of time uh, just in forums like uh, on on Reddit or, or in the Spiceworks forum, you know, trying to, uh, you know, just to help out people when it comes to their network management challenges. If I, if I know how to answer a question, I definitely want to provide that assistance, whether it, you know, whether it's helps Ovic or not, it's, you know, about sort of advancing that uh, network management community. Um, 
you know, no two days are the same. That's for sure. <laughs> so you've definitely not got that challenge that we talked about where you, there's anything that you either tolerate or hate in your work. It's like every single day, you, you are very happy doing what you're doing, aren't you? <laughs> I, I wouldn't say that there's, you know, there's, there's, I definitely enjoy the majority of it. It's way more than that, you know, 48%. I probably, you know, 95% of the day is, is that enjoyable. And that's a, a great place to be at. Yeah. And, and again, public thank you to you, the, you know, the time that you spend in social media and the forum sort of giving freely of your advice. I think it, it reflects not uh, uh, well, uh, not only well on you, but as Orvik as a company. And I want to take this opportunity as well. You know, we, you're listening to uh, the Tub Talk podcast. If you've not already checked it out, check the Frankly MSP podcast out as well from uh, Jennifer and the team at uh, Orvik. It's a really, really good podcast with lots of great listening um, on there as well. And uh, talking of community, like the world has changed changed in the last 12 months sort of irrevocably you and I got together didn't we it was ooh, uh, January of 2020 and we got together at the frankly MSP live uh, conference over in uh, Santa Barbara in California there and it's the first time we had an opportunity to get together and uh, yep. even though it was only 13 months ago it feels like a world away now doesn't it <laughs> It feels like ages ago. That was uh, that was actually the, the last business trip that I had before we sort of start started closing things down for the pandemic. Um, so probably a good one to end on. It was uh, definitely a lot of fun to to meet uh, you know a lot of Avic partners and other you know MSPs uh, from across the globe. Um, definitely a good, a good time and uh, th- thanks for joining us there, Richard. It was definitely oh, a lot it was fun to, to have you meet you there. I was honoured to be uh, to be invited to uh, to go along to that conference, and I was only talking to my wife Claire the other day. You had the, the opportunity to meet. What yeah. a great way! You know, we were looking back now. Not only was it a great trip anyway, um, but when the the pandemic hit and the lockdown hit and everything, we're looking back, Claire and I, and like that was a really good trip, and we're so glad we made that trip and got to spend it with you guys. So thank you again for inviting us over there. Any, I know it's a bit early to say, but any news on maybe if the Frankly MSP event will come back in the in the future when things are a little bit different? I know the team is hard at work now taking a look at, you know, um, the different di- event dynamics, understanding whether there's an appetite uh, for, for people to go to events or not. So there's definitely a lot of work going into understanding whether that's, you know, going to be a thing, uh, you know, not in 2021, I don't think, but let's keep our fingers crossed for 2022. Well, I hope you and I get a chance to uh, to have a beer together at some point in the near future anyway. <laughs> Steve, sure. really, really appreciate your time today. Again, for anybody listening, you can go and grab the show notes uh, to the show with all the links that we've talked about, but orvic.com forward slash network field 21. That's orvic, A-U-V-I-K.com forward slash network field 21. That's where you can go and grab uh, this report from. Uh, it is excellent. You know, it's a fairly short read. You know, you'll get it read in less than 30 minutes very graphical for people who love pictures like me it was great to look at as well but you've just done an incredible job putting this information together so thank you for you know for sort of sharing uh, the knowledge what would you say if you could give one piece of advice for anybody listening today folks who manage networks what would that piece of advice be I would say take a look at, at the tasks that you uh, are currently doing manually uh, and try to understand what are those things you can automate. I know we've touched on automation a lot, but that would be uh, probably my one key takeaway. Uh, you know, we spend far too much time doing things manually that we should be automating. So what is it in the network management realm that I can do to automate? Yeah, great advice. Steve, thank you again. And thank you for all the time that you spend in the forums. People are going to find it really easy to find you online. But if anybody wants to reach out and continue the conversation with you, uh, what's the best method for them to do so? Sure. So uh, best way to reach me is you can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, you can go ahead and follow me or just uh, connect. Definitely open to connecting as well. Um, Steve Petrushuk. I think the link can probably go in, in the show notes here. It's a little bit long to read out here over the <laughs> <laughs> over the audio. No worries. We'll include all of your social media details and the uh, LinkedIn in link in the show notes as well. Steve, thank you so much for today. I'd love for you, if you are open to it, to uh, to come back again. Hopefully, not in five years' time when the next report is produced, but sooner than that to talk about the state of the network management. Absolutely, I look forward to it, Richard. Thanks so much. Hey folks, Richard here. Thanks for listening today. I know you've got a ton of options for who you listen to nowadays, so I really appreciate your support. Do you have any feedback on this episode? Ideas for future guests? Tweet me at Tublog using the hashtag TubTalk. I respond to every tweet and really appreciate your feedback.
Hey team, this is Richard again. Just one more thing before you take off, and that is MSP Insights. Now, every Tuesday, I share my thoughts on the business of IT with you, the managed service community. Thousands of managed service providers already subscribe to MSP Insights. It's easy to sign up, easy to cancel. MSP Insights is basically a short email from me every Tuesday without fail with advice on growing your IT business, plus cool resources I found, discovered, or started exploring that week. It's kind of like my dark of cool things and often includes articles or books I've read, tools I've discovered and events I think you'd be interested in, often sent to me by my friends and Tub Talk podcast guests. So if that sounds fun, a short tiny bite of MSP goodness every Tuesday and you'd like to try it out, just go to go.tub.co forward slash Tuesday. That's go.tub.co forward slash Tuesday. Drop in your email and you'll get the very next one. Thanks for listening.